Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Very excited today to be joined by Shannon Dowling. Shannon is an architect and space planner at Air St. Gross. She helps lead research and planning around learning environments. She's been doing some really relevant, cutting edge stuff. We're going to get to all of that. But before we do any of that, Shannon, welcome to Trending in Education. Thanks, Mike. It's really great to be here. Yeah, it's fantastic to have you. We always like to begin by getting to know our guests in their own words. Can you share with us your origin story? What got you to this point in your professional life? Sure. So I'm an architect by trade. I've been an architect for 20 years now. All 20 years have been concentrated in what I call quote unquote learning environments, which I'm sure your audience is very familiar with, but it's a K-12 higher education. And then anything that supports the growth of the individual, like libraries, museums, cultural centers. So in addition to my actual job as an architect. I'm actually also a SCUP fellow this year for the Society of College and University Planners. Mm -hmm. And for that fellowship, I am studying how architects and planners advance initiatives around um, equity and belonging mm -hmm. on the college campus. I've also been an educator myself at Virginia Commonwealth University for over a decade. So it's always nice because I have an experience both inside the classroom that I can bring to my work. Yeah, yeah, that sounds amazing. And <laughs> it also sounds like if you've been doing this for 20 years, there are probably some macro trends you've seen over time. And I'd love to understand how you see maybe the last 20 years unfolding quickly. And then the last year feels like about 20 years worth of transformation that's been happening. So I think we'll probably want to dive into that next, but taking a step back maybe and thinking over the last 20 years, what have you been noticing? I'm sure there's plenty to talk about, but are there any like larger trends in the design and learning spaces that uh, jump to mind? Yeah, so I, I started thinking about back in the like the late 90s, which is when I graduated from college and first started practicing. That's when really the term third spaces came about. Mm. And it came about by urban planners. And then it was adapted in the early 2000s by Starbucks as a, a way to advertise a place that's not quite home and not quite work. And really over the last two decades, that term third spaces, the sticky spaces, the informal spaces where we don't ha quite have scheduled space, but we're not quite at home. That's really been the trend driving the change across education. And then obviously the internet was invented in the late 90s. Whiteboards were invented. The idea of like projection has changed a lot. Uh, VR, AR. So it's just how all this stuff has come together over the last two decades has really changed how students um, learn and then how the classroom and how different learning environments respond to that. Yeah. Um, and then we overlay the pandemic on top of that. Exactly. And that's where I'd also love to get a little more, maybe after we talk a, a bit about the pandemic, what's the design process like for learning spaces and how far out ahead do you have to be thinking? What's some of the range of the, the design planning and design thinking, which is another trend we've talked about a lot on the show. Architecture in some ways has been doing pretty advanced design thinking for hundreds of years, uh, thousands of years, really, if you get at it, I'd love to, to get a little more of how to think like an architect and how thinking like an architect maybe is a useful uh, model for people who are trying to understand learning contexts. Mm -hmm. So we always talk about how in education, especially in higher education, you're training students for jobs that don't yet exist. Mm -hmm. So how do you design a space for someone to learn a skill that doesn't exist yet? And so that's all actually a really big driving factor because then spaces have to be very flexible. And usually you're designing a space, I would say three years if you're lucky, but usually more like five years, 10 years out. And the life cycle of a building itself is about 50 years. The life cycle of a piece of furniture is 10 years. Mm -hmm. So you're designing like right when the furniture is transitioning, the life cycle of technology is two years. Yeah, And so you can't really design, if you design a building around technology, that technology is going to be obsolete by the time the building gets built. So it's really important for architects to think about learning spaces to really make sure that they stay on top of trends and to, to really design for what's next versus what's happening right now. Yeah. And I think the moment in my career where that became really apparent and that I became really interested, not just in, you know, architecture as a design profession, but really about learning and how people learn and what the trends of learning. My middle son is dyslexic. 
And when he was in kindergarten and first grade, I started noticing that he couldn't spell his spelling words if he was sitting still, but he could spell his spelling words if he was standing up and he was doing all these hand motions and moving around. And so at the time I had a chair, it's by a furniture company called VS and it's called a hockey chair. And it basically has a ball on the bottom mm. and you can move around while you're talking. And I sat him on that chair and I said, okay, now spell. And he could move around and he could spell perfectly. Mm. At the same time at work, I was designing a new school of education. And so I was learning about how the teachers teach the teachers to teach. And so it was this merging of my personal world and my professional world coming together that really just got me, the mama bear came out and I got really involved in, wow, like how do people learn and how can what we do as designers actually improve the way they learn? Yeah. And if we just put a bunch of desk in a row, students can't fidget, like they, they can't always think that if they can't see natural light outside, how does that impact their mentality, if they're uncomfortable in the classroom, if they're hungry in the classroom, and so it just, all of a sudden, the parent in me and the professional in me kind of merged, and just, that's when I just decided I want to know everything I can possibly know to make sure that everything I have an impact on is better and can contribute to a better experience for the student. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And then if you think about that, let's fast forward ahead to uh, 2020 when everyone suddenly is confronted with a different model of where education can take place. Parents to tap back into the mama bear you were just talking about a lot of mama bear, papa bears, grandma bears, a lot of, a lot of people are suddenly confronted with online learning, with their kids in their homes, with them, all of us have a new attitude, relationship towards space and ventilation and open air. It's transformative for all of us, but I'd imagine for an architect, and then particularly when education was so disrupted in the last year, any thoughts, uh, anything to share about how transformational it's been and how you're thinking about the future? So thought number one is everybody um, that's listening should appreciate teachers a lot more, right? And I think that's been our, our main learning lesson is, oh my goodness. But I think we've started to think about equity a lot more and the pandemic really brought to the forefront the fact that all these things that support learning weren't necessarily equal. So, okay, you can't just go home and learn on Zoom because you don't have an internet connection or you're used to getting all your meals at school or even on, on a college campus, they couldn't just send everyone home because there's international students and they can't get flights. So it's really brought to light a lot of issues around equity and inclusion. And then the other thing that it's been interesting that's really brought to light is the issues around wellness and this idea that outdoor spaces really play a part in our life and meditation spaces and spaces to stop and breathe and just mm -hmm. the ability when everyone's on the screen, everyone's the same size. Everyone has equal say. You can use the chat, you can use the microphone. And it really made us think about how we consider the classroom again. And when we think about instructional proximics. So basically instructional proximics is someone within your social space of 12 to 15 feet. Mm -hmm. If they're beyond that, they're in a lecture space, right? And so they're already a remote learner. And so therefore, if you're going to learn in a lecture hall, I personally think that you might as well be learning virtually. And so right. how's that actually going to influence how our college campuses are designed. And if we don't need these spaces where you can't, what I say, reach and teach, mm -hmm. where the instructor can't reach and teach every student, then what do those spaces become? And yeah. how can we make that learning and that connection more meaningful? Yeah. And then I'd love to get out of maybe some examples of, of how different sorts of spaces can be designed, how much maybe they need to be modular, or if there's some, some sort of design principles that make sense when thinking about designing learning spaces. And then the two uh, other ideas related to this are problem-based learning, learning in groups, and then also experiential learning, which is you know, maybe going outside or doing some collective, they're, they're interrelated. But, but when designing learning spaces, there's the traditional model of a stack of classrooms piled together that everyone will be learning through. And then there are other emerging models. And I'd love to get some of your perspective on how you're thinking about design, how some of the more forward thinking design concepts might be emerging for folks who are trying to understand where this world might be headed. 
I, I like to look at trends across um, different platforms that influence education. And so one of the things that we're talking about a lot is office spaces and how we're not all going to go back to an office and be assigned in a seat and sit there from nine to five. Mm -hmm. And I think that in that same way that offices could translate to the classroom. And so we need to stop attaching learning to the Carnegie unit, to this idea that butts and seats equates to learning. Mm -hmm. And so then if you think about taking that layer away. And then the other layer that I think people don't necessarily know a lot is that 25 to 30 percent of non-residential space on campus pre-pandemic was dedicated to office space. Hmm. And so if you think about that 25 to 30 percent of office space and you think about that space is likely going to decrease over the next 10 years or so, mm -hmm. what can that space actually become? So if you have your office space is going to decrease, your scheduled classroom space is likely going to decrease, you're going to have a lot more space on campus available for other things like, for instance, this, these sort of meaningful connections, these places for students to gather, places for experiential learning, places for AR, VR. I have heard from a lot of students they want to be back on campus. However, the idea of being back on campus doesn't necessarily mean that those students want to be back in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've talked to him or not yet, but Brian Beatty from San Francisco State University, he's been doing high flex learning for mm -hmm. like 15 or 16 years now. Okay. And I was asking him about that. So that basically says students have the choice, right? They have the choice every single time, whether they want to go physically sit present in the classroom, whether they want to take the class synchronously or whether they want to take the class asynchronously. So from week to week, they can choose. Mm -hmm. And he told me that like the sort of rule of thumb that, they, that they've found at San Francisco State is that about 50% of the students choose to show up in person. And then so the other 50% that choose to take the class virtually, about half of those students are still on campus somewhere. They're just not in the classroom. Yeah. So if you think about the idea that you have to take that 20, 25, 30 square feet out of the classroom, but yet you have to substitute that somewhere else on campus. And suddenly our campuses become a lot more informal and a lot more flexible. And I think that creates a much um, richer learning environment for students. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting on a number of fronts. Your first point about how learning environments frequently mirror professional environments. There's a much broader consensus that the world of the workplace, while it'll come back, will come back with very different design. I think more folks may be leaning towards, let's just go back to the way things used to be in a learning context. Do you have anything to say to folks who are thinking now, phew, the pandemic is over. Let's go I'm back exhausted. To uh, yeah, we're tired. Let's just go back to what we know. Any thoughts to that line of reasoning? I think that's going to happen. And I think that's probably going to happen a lot over the next year. And I think students are going to rebel and say, no, we're not doing this. We've learned that we can learn just as well virtually. We can learn just as well remotely. And something about that on-campus experience, and not just the on-campus, but the in-person, in-the-classroom experience is not meaningful to me. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And so I feel like before there was a little bit of pushback from some professors around active learning, even though study after study has showed us that active learning is 1.5 times more effective than traditional learning. I think that we're going to have to start going that way in order to offer those students something to come to class for. I think there's also going to be this shakeup where Universities are going to try more in-person learning. They're probably going to get a little bit of pushback. I know that they're getting a lot of pushback from the professors about hybrid learning. I don't necessarily think hybrid learning is the way to go either. And I think yeah. they're going to have to really try a bunch of things to find what the right mix is. The thing I've been encouraging universities to do is really stay flexible and to think about sandboxing mm. and prototyping and just don't spend a whole bunch of money on something until you've tried it. But let's just take a whole bunch of ideas, throw them out there and see what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. 
Um, you also mentioned equity and the, the awakening around uh, social justice and the digital divide. How is that informing the design of learning spaces? Do you have any examples or, or concepts uh, for us to understand? Uh, yeah, I actually started studying this about two years ago. And last summer, all of a sudden, we had this pandemic that was brought on by the COVID-19. And then we had this pandemic over the summer brought on by George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others that people basically said, no, we Black Lives Matter, we care about people, we are sick of the racial injustices that are going on, and we demand something to be done about it. And for the first time, universities have been coming to architects and saying, what does that mean to the space? Mm -hmm. And how does space actually promote inclusivity? And I think my personal opinion from everything I've researched is that it's really all about choice. Mm -hmm. And it's really all about giving the student the ability to come into a learning space and to find a, their own spot in that space that makes them comfortable mm -hmm. without necessarily having to disclose any kind of difference that they mm -hmm. have. And I think we're going to see classroom spaces that offer places to sit, places to stand, places to lean, places to work in groups, places to work by yourself. It's going to accommodate a bunch of different neurodiversities. It's going to accommodate students of different ages. There's a lot of talk around transgender students and bathrooms and stuff like that. And yeah. somebody pointed out to me something really interesting about students with physical disabilities that can't necessarily use the restroom the same way the rest of us do. And especially as we're talking about veterans coming back to college campuses. And mm -hmm. so um, just considering restrooms that have adult changes tables and them alongside restrooms that are a little bit more gender neutral. So I think there's just a lot of different ways we can consider accommodating people of different abilities. And I think that architects have to abide by ADA and code, but that's like a starting point. That's not a finishing point. And I, I feel like that's going to get brought to the forefront a lot more over the next couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. We've done a, a number of shows on universal design for learning and universal design. And, and then I realized as you were talking, oh, Shannon has to apply the, the root principles. A lot of the ideas that are being borrowed in universal design for learning began with really a revolution in architecture. How recent is the, the movement towards adding ramps and curb cuts and, and all that? That's now become very much a standard, I think, in a lot of uh, architecture, but it's something that I think we can take uh, for granted. And then I, I'd love maybe just building off that example, if there are other things on the horizon based on what you're seeing uh, in architecture. Yeah, so it's actually pretty recent. You might want to look me up, but I think the ADA code wasn't actually implemented until 1996. Wow. And so a lot of our buildings are a lot older than that. So we've had to do a lot of retrofits, but really what is a retrofit saying to a student? We say, you need to go around to the back of the building and enter the door by the dumpster. Yeah. And by the way, when you enter the door, there's a big stairwell in front of you. That's not really saying, hey, you really belong here and we right. want you to learn beside us and we want to learn from you. And so really over the last, I would say almost just about the last 10 years or something, it's been really much more about not just accessibility, but universal design yeah. and how to make design completely universal, not just that everyone can be accommodated, but that everyone is welcome and everyone has a seat at the table. And one of the things that kind of drives me crazy is so in the last like maybe five or six years, every new academic building that you walk into has that big cascading social stair right at yes. the door. Yeah. And they're very beautiful. Uh, but if you start to look at them, the people that you see sitting on the social stair are your traditional students mm -hmm. that are 18 to 22 years old, they have perfect, quote unquote, normal physical abilities, and everyone else goes around and avoids that area. Yeah. And so I feel like that's going to be one of those things that we look back on in 10 or 20 years and say that was the mistake of that time yeah. that we made that when we before the pandemic, before we were thinking about inclusion really well. Yeah, that's interesting, too, because those are the they're they're all over brochures. They're good photo ops. Frequently that design goes into it, but then when it actually needs to be used and used by everybody in an inclusive way. Also, I'd love to, you're touching on belonging is a big piece of the diversity 
equity and inclusion conversation that I think folks don't necessarily understand how foundational it is, but it, it sounds like that is something you've been focused on specifically is how do you make sure that everyone feels like they, they have a sense of belonging on campus? Yeah. And so it goes all the way back to Maslow, right? Mm -hmm. And this idea that your physiological needs have to be met, which we've really has been brought to the forefront during the pandemic. And then you have to be able to belong in order to reach that higher, the top of the triangle about acquiring knowledge. And yeah. isn't that really what education is all about? Yeah. And so if you're not comfortable in a spot and you don't feel welcome there and you don't feel like you belong there, then how are you actually going to learn yeah. in that space? Mm -hmm. And so if we continue designing these front facing spaces where students can't see what's behind them, where they can't turn around and learn from their the student that's sitting beside them, like how comfortable is everybody in that environment? Mm -hmm. And if we think about the fact that the U.S. is becoming so much more multicultural, we have to really start to consider things like building names and artwork and mm -hmm. color schemes and orientation. And how is all this going to influence it so that Every student that comes to a campus or comes into a school says, okay, I can belong here. And yeah. if I belong here, then I can actually learn here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to touch on, I want to get to libraries too. My wife uh, will, oh, yeah. will give me credit by bringing up libraries. We'll, we'll come to that next. But before we get there, the other theme that we hear a lot about these days is how polarized we are and how civil discourse for, uh, between people who might have differing opinions is something that's much harder and harder to find. And, and frequently university campuses in particular become flashpoints for a lot of those types of conversations. How do architects understand, or how do you as an architect understand designing for both facilitating discourse, but also making sure that there's not a, a constant battleground of ideas where two armed camps are, are competing with one another? Yeah. So the first thing, and I don't know if this fully answers your question or not, but the first thing I started thinking about is the fact that traditionally campuses have had the law and or the green space in the middle. And that space is this formal space. And there's a ring of academic buildings on um, both sides of it with a library or a church or whatever it is at the end. And that was a really great Eurocentric model that came over that we've started building around. But actually, as campuses have gotten more urban and modern, we've started building plazas. And those plazas have become the hotbed of protest mm. and different activities. And so it's interesting that those have become this more informal space that connects the residential life and the academic life. But those are the places that are alive and that really spark debate and protest and people can go there and they can program them there themselves versus these kind of like formal mm. green lawns that feel very stoic and traditional. So mm. it's been really interesting to just see that and some of the other things I've heard if we're still on the outside of a building is how the campus is designed and what the materiality is if it's very brick and gothic um, collegiate gothic architecture maybe that's somewhere that someone doesn't feel as comfortable if the plants are completely manicured versus natural landscaping that's somewhere that people aren't going to feel um, as comfortable so it's really about how do you create campus design that once again we go back to belonging that make people feel like I'm comfortable expressing myself here and being myself here I've also heard I've asked the same question to students a lot and you know they say they that they speak up in the classes where they feel like they can turn around and talk to their neighbors mm -hmm. that they're uncomfortable in the classes where they have to face forward all the time so I think that the more we can create campuses where students can actually talk to each other and get to know each other and mm -hmm. learn from one another versus this voice at the front of the room, the more interesting our campuses are going to be and the more creative they're going to be and the more they're going to promote a multitude of discourses. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I was talking to you briefly about libraries before we got started. It does seem like that's a space where the architecture and the design thinking has opened up over the last 20 years or so. Any ideas from libraries or other spaces that are not maybe traditional classrooms that uh, architects are thinking about that the rest of us might want to pay a little more attention to? 
Yeah, I was talking to you about this before and then actually a quick plug here, Elizabeth Bickley and my office and myself are going to give a talk about this at um, Trade Line Space Strategies in October, but it's really about how the design of libraries and what we've learned from that could influence the rest of campus. And so we were talking a little bit about how the digital revolution and the turn of the century like made libraries as we know it obsolete because we didn't need a place for a bunch of books. And so libraries had to think, what can we do? So they've transformed from this place for books to this place for people. They've become louder. They have let um, people eat in the library. There's more technology in the library. They've started to put meeting rooms and maker spaces, meditation spaces, all these sort of unprogrammed spaces where people can no longer just um, absorb knowledge, but actually create knowledge. And the library is now 24 seven most successful building hub of the university. So now how can we take those lessons that we've learned and apply them more broadly? So this idea that if a building isn't about Carnegie-based scheduling seats and butts, and it's not about like course after course and student after student, what's it about? Mm -hmm. And it's going to end up being about connections and about meaning and just like the library was before. So it's almost like we just have to take what we learned at the library and figure out how to scale it. Yeah. That's really interesting, and we'll have to we'll definitely include links to your uh, upcoming appearance in October for those who are are curious about that. There's, I think there's a lot going on in that idea. We're getting closer towards the end of the conversation here, Shannon. So this is where we try to look towards the future and try to understand what else is emerging. You mentioned AR and VR and some of the new spatial interactive technologies that are emerging. That's definitely something we've talked a lot as a trend that's capturing people's imaginations. Any thoughts on that or thoughts on other things that are new and emerging that are relevant to how you're thinking about designing learning spaces? So thoughts that are new and emerging that may or may not apply. There's a professor at the University of Texas in Austin that has started teaching his course this last semester via hologram. Mm -hmm. If we start to think about how holograms are going to influence education, and I can imagine a classroom somewhere in the future where there's both real people and virtual people, avatars. So either you go to class th today or you send your avatar to class for you. And then in the roommate world, could you have a virtual roommate as a way to keep up with people around the country? My 16-year-old um, is constantly on Discord all day. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, if you know about Discord. So he's sure. basically, he on one camera, he's watching his professor or his teacher. And on the other screen, he's just Discording a whole bunch of people in different classes at all times. And it's multitasking constantly. So what does that look like when we give it a physical presence? The other thing I keep strategizing with some of my colleagues over is this idea of a nomadic student and plug and play learning and mm -hmm subscription-based university where if the student becomes the 60-year learner where you plug in and out of education once every 10 years or so, how can you transport yourself and plug in and out of universities? And are we going to get to go as far as Japanese sleeping pods or this Airbnb of being a student? Can you check into a university for a week at a time and then yeah. be somewhere else globally and, and check in over there? And what's that going to look like? And what's that going to do to residence halls. So I feel like in tons of different ways, like the campus environment could, if we let it really grow and strengthen over the next 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating stuff. You, I started thinking about the WeWorks for learning where just check in, even as any point in your life, that, 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 that really got my wheels turning. As we're wrapping up here, there's some really interesting stuff. I don't know if we've had a lot of uh, conversations like this on the show before. If folks want to learn more about this type of stuff, do you have any recommendations where they could look for more information about the type of work that you do? Sure. Eric St. Chris just finished up writing a white paper on this. It's going to be on our blog soon. And it's basically um, 
looking at spaces post-pandemic, what is looking at formal academic spaces, looking at research spaces, looking at informal spaces, and looking at student life spaces. And then it's almost three columns. And the first one is, here's some beginner things we can do. And the middle column is, if you want to take it a little further. And then the third column is like, hey, this is out there on the horizon. This is bold. Um, mm. Like, you know, this is like Japanese sleeping pods for universities. Yeah. Type crazy. But hey, I personally also follow, and I'm, I think you've had them on your show before for, but I follow Brian Alexander a mm-hmm. lot. Oh yeah. And so I like to keep up with his guests and, and just hearing what they say and then trying to like, as an architect, what's, how's that going to translate into the, the built world? And that's how I read everything every New York times article, every wall street journal article that comes out, every chronicle of higher education, what are they saying? And how's the built world going to respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Shannon Dowling, I'd love to have you back on again in the future. Uh, this perspective, I think it's really uh, important. And as we mentioned before, frequently where architects go, the rest of us eventually go in a few years. If you want to get ahead of the game, just because the planning cycles are so far and there's a lot of intentionally looking beyond the here and now, architects are, are great resources. Thank you very much uh, for joining us on, on today's show. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. And, uh, And that was Ayers St. Gross. Shannon is architect and space planner there. We'll be sharing links to all this information if you want to learn more uh, on our website. Thanks as always for listening. This is Trending in Education. 